Welcome to the latest in our series of Parenting in a Pandemic. Uh, my name is Stephen Balcom, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute. FOSI is an international nonprofit organization which works to make the online world safer for kids and their families. We convene leaders in industry, government, and the nonprofit sectors to collaborate and innovate new solutions and policies in the field of online safety. COVID-19 has upended the rhythm of life for most families. Uh, parents are either doing their best to homeschool their kids while working from home or heading out to do essential jobs. Kids are missing the structure and routine of school, extracurricular activities, sports, and now even summer camp is endangered. Much attention is being given to the psychological toll this is taking on adults and children alike, but there's another lesson emerging in this time of lockdown. While parents are busy working to find solutions for the new challenges they're facing, kids are being given greater freedom to structure their own days. They are figuring out uh, ways to be creative, both online and outdoors, in ways we haven't seen in years. Some would say that they are flourishing. Now to help us to explore the new and old ways that kids are adapting to this new normal within the global crisis that we're all in, we will be joined by two remarkable experts in their fields. Peter Gray is an author and research professor of psychology at Boston College. He is a founding board member of Let Grow and president of the nonprofit Alliance for Self-Directed Education which is aimed at creating a world in which children's natural ways of learning are facilitated rather than suppressed. And if you haven't seen it already, I highly suggest you check out his TED Talk on play. It's very compelling. Welcome, Peter. I'm ha very happy to be here. Great. And also Lenore Skenazy. She's co-founder and president of Let Grow, a nonprofit promoting independence as a critical part of childhood and the author of Free Range Kids, How to Raise Safe, Self-Reliant Children Without Going Nuts with Worry. Uh, at Let Grow, Lenore oversees school programs, an online community, and legislative efforts, all promoting the idea that when adults step back, kids step up, growing resourceful, resilient, and ready for the world. Welcome, Lenore. Hey, thanks. It's like all our taglines in a row. It just starts sounding kind of overwhelming. But yeah, we believe that kids have a lot to do and say and, and discover when we do step back a little. And obviously, COVID has been an amazing time for kids discovering who they are, for, yeah, sure. for better and worse. <laughs> I am so excited uh, to be hosting this. Um, I'll just say personally that, I'm, of course, I grew up as a free-range kid back in the uh, uh, 60s, um, you know, basically I went as far as my bike could get me back for dinner at six o'clock um, and my parents had no idea, no clue where I was. Uh, here I am, I'm evidence that actually that worked out okay. Um, for you. <laughs> I, I built a great deal of resilience. I fell out of some trees um, and I have some scars to prove it, but here I am. Um, for those of you watching this, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button that's down at the bottom. Uh, I will be alerted as those questions or comments come through, and I will try to uh, get to as many of those throughout our conversation as possible. Um, so let's begin. Let's jump in. There's so much uh, to cover here. I'm so excited to have you both on the same uh, webinar. Peter, let's begin um, a little bit with your background and your uh, groundbreaking book, Free to Learn. Um, what, what led you to write that, and how has your thinking evolved since that time? Yeah, well, I, I was, <clears throat> there were several things that led me to write the book, one of which is my realization at some point that kids were being deprived of the kind of childhood that you just described for yourself and that I grew up in. Um, you know, it struck me, I think it first struck me, we, I, um, my first wife died some years ago and I remarried and uh, to a woman who had two young, relatively young children and to, um, to uh, sort of as a bonding trip, we went to the Dominican Republic and we stayed at a resort where you don't learn anything about the Dominican Republic, but 
then we drove into the city and I saw kids playing. I saw kids playing. <laughs> they were, this was 2002. They were playing in the street. They were playing their own soccer games that they were made up. I didn't see any adults around them. And it struck me. That's the way I used to play. <laughs> That's the way everybody used to play. And it struck me. I don't see that anymore. I don't see that anymore. And so it was a sudden realization that life has changed. Now, it, independently of that, I had been doing some research on how children learn to uh, learn skills through play, how they learn through following their own curiosity. I have for quite some years been interested in how children educate themselves when they have the opportunity to do so. And so I'd already been thinking about play and writing about play. And then a, a thought occurred to me. So we have, we have children growing up deprived of the opportunity to play, to just go out and play, f play freely without, you know, according to my research, according to what everybody says about play, there ought to be some negative consequences of that. So then I began to look into that and what I discovered, uh, this wasn't my own research, but this is other people's research, showed that over this same period of time that we've been gradually taking free play away from children, there have been huge increases in all sorts of mental disorders in childhood, just as I would have predicted. <laughs> you know, this play is how children develop resilience. Play is how children overcome depression. I mean, one, one uh, play scholar said, pointed out the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. You know, you take away play and kids are going to be depressed. Um, oh, <laughs> kind of a no-brainer, right? <laughs> and that's what we're seeing. Record levels of depression, record levels of anxiety, because instead of playing, what we're doing is we're putting them into, into situations that are kind of anxiety provoking. More and more school where they're constantly being judged and measured and compared to others. And even when they're not in school, they're in often in adult directed, adult judged, adult measured kinds of activities. And then <laughs> no brainer, they're depressed and they're anxious. Um, the suicide levels have, have skyrocketed in recent decades. They're now six times what they were when you and I were kids in the 50s and 60s for, for children. Um, so, so this was a startling, um, not surprising, but very um, important observation in my view. And so it's become kind of a mission for me, you know, it's a, kind of. what, oh my what God. are we going to do about this? <laughs> you know, so that's, that's a little bit about my background. And then I met Lenore, who uh, right. had written the Crusade book for the same thing. Kids, and I said, Here, here's somebody who's made the same discovery and uh, we need to put our heads together. <laughs> Well, that, that's fantastic, so. and thank you. I'd love to dig into some of the things you've already mentioned, uh, particularly things like uh, resiliency, and um, but let, let's, let's, uh, let's hold fire on that. Lenore, um, a few years ago, you were described as the world's worst mom. Uh, how on earth did you get that title, <laughs> and, and what did it spur you on to do in terms of uh, writing your book, Free Range Kids? Right. Well, um, actually, World's Worst Mom was a promotion. I began as just America's Worst Mom, and I worked really hard. And, you know, at last, I called into that corner office of, you know, mom shaming, and, you know, today's the day. Uh, so the, 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 the founding story is that when our younger son was nine, and you'll hear my husband banging in the background. I don't know, every time I'm online, there's like something he has to be making, <laughs> like a, a, I don't know what, like his own bathtub or something. Anyways, it's loud, sorry. Um, but when our younger son was nine, he started asking my husband and me if we would take him someplace he'd never been before and let him find his own way home by the subway, because we live in New York City. And so uh, we decided to do that. We, my husband, who's not America's worst dad, somehow, and I said, yes. And so one sunny Sunday, I took uh, our son Izzy to Bloomingdale's. I said, today's the day. I left him there. I went home another way by bus. Uh, and he had to go into the subway, which is right under Bloomingdale's, take the subway down to the 34th Street, the miracle on 34th Street Street. Out he comes, takes a bus across town, comes into our apartment, like levitating, I'd say, with pride and, and happiness that he'd been that he'd done something and that he'd been allowed to do it that we believed in him and that he had succeeded in the hero's journey 
And I was a newspaper columnist at the time when there were newspapers. And so I wrote a column, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, Fox News and NPR, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of across the spectrum there, um, describing, you know, what I'd done. And that's what got me the, this nickname, uh, America's Worst Mom, because while some people would, a lot of people did exactly what we were just doing here, you know, reminiscing about how much they, they cherished the freedom that they had as kids and the bike rides to nowhere and the hours spent, you know, kicking a ball or just, you know, aimless but joyful or not even always joyful, just aimless. They had free time and they were grateful for it. Not every moment was scheduled with something very, very important taught to them by an adult. Anyways, and then they'd say, but of course I can't let my own kids do that because times have changed. And I'm a reporter by training and I, I can read FBI statistics and I saw crime going <laughs> since the 90s and reaching a 25 year low. And so the times that people were worried about changing had changed, but they changed for the better. Actually, the streets have become safer, kids have become safer, even cars have become safer, you know, in terms of hitting kids. So. Um, so I started my blog and I called it free range kids. And then I wrote the book free range kids to say that I, I love safety and you know, helmets and car seats and seatbelts and mouth guards. And now I can't wait for a vaccine, but I just don't think kids are in danger, um, of the, the man in the white van. <laughs> and, if, and if I was a man who was intent on children, told me I would not get a white van. I would get, a, a, you know, a golden Prius, whatever. I'm not going to steal children <laughs> off, off message. Um, the point is simply that we had lost all confidence in our kids, in our community, in our own parenting, in our ability to, to, to give kids enough lessons to keep them pretty safe and to never expect them to be totally without, you know, some decisions they have to make, some risks they have to face, but none so gigantic that we can't let them out of the house. And after doing that for 10 years, um, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, and a man named Dan Chuckman, um, came to me and said, let's start an organization together. And we, we pulled in Peter and we started Let Grow, which is dedicated to the idea that childhood is, um, independence when you're a kid is really important. It's foundational. And mm -hmm. yet we take it away. And then once again, when you take it away, what happens? Well, then I turn it over to Peter and he talks about all the things that happen when you don't have play because free time and free play go together. And we're seeing bad things happen with kids not having enough independence and good things happen, including now, <laughs> right now, when they are given some free time to just go off and find what interests them, mostly for good that, and sometimes. For that's good. a great place because um, I have to say, this is we're entering the third month of, of working from home here at FOSI and many other people as well. Um, I have a second floor perch where I look out onto a small park that doesn't have any play equipment, but it does have trees and it has bushes and it has open grass. And I am seeing something I haven't seen in decades. And that is I'm seeing kids on their own in, in twos and threes and sometimes in lo making forts climbing the trees, wow. riding by on bicycles, uh, on their skateboards, hanging out without their parents. Now, it, am I the only one seeing that, Peter? Or is, is this something that no, you're I'm, seeing? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm definitely seeing the same thing. I, I, I'm a bicyclist myself. I go out as part of my daily routine on a 10 to 15 mile bicycle, bicycle ride uh, in the, my town and the neighboring towns. I've lived in this town now for three years, and I, you could almost think that the place was a movie set, that these are just uh, fake buildings. You never saw anybody outdoors. You never saw kids outdoors, so unless you went by when they're waiting for the bus, school bus in the morning, or getting off the school bus, with their parents standing next to them, of course. Uh, now I go out and every trip out, I see kids on bicycles. I, I have seen, I think I've seen about eight situations where a parent was teaching a kid for the first time to ride a bicycle over, the that, over this period of time. Right. One trip, I saw three independent examples of that. Wow. <laughs> I had never seen a parent teaching a bicycle, kid to ride a bicycle around here. And they ranged in age from, you know, five, which would be the age that kids learn to ride bicycles typically when I was a kid, on through about 12, <laughs> learning how to ride Wait, a bicycle for the first time. I have time. to say, 
I, this weekend, Peter, out where I am, I saw, I, at first I thought it was his wife, but it was a guy was teaching, I'm assuming his daughter, let's hope, his daughter who looked about 16 or 17 to ride a bike. And I thought, good for her, because I think it's very scary to start riding a bike at that age, but she was doing it and, she, you know, for the time. It. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm seeing people, I'm seeing whole families outdoors playing <laughs> games in their front yard, I, which I never saw before. I'm suddenly seeing badminton sets and sort of modern <laughs> versions of such games that I don't really know what they are, but they look a little like badminton being set up. Uh, kids playing. Um, you know, it, what's, what's kind of interesting to me, you know, I was kind of worried that with kids growing up not playing, they wouldn't know how to do it, but they seem to know how to do it when they get yeah. the opportunity. A fish That's a to good water. Thing. Yeah. They, they get it pretty quickly, especially the younger kids. And I, and I think when there's, when there's younger kids and older kids, the younger kids kind of help the older kids uh, get playful. <laughs> so right. so you're, you're obviously seeing it as well, Lenore. Um, to talk about the role of independence. Why is independence so important? And maybe link it to that video that we showed at the very beginning. I think there was something called the Independence Challenge, Lenore. That right, you guys so, yeah, so at Let Grow, we were seeing exactly what we've just been talking about, that there was something really interesting and organically happening, um, which was that kids were not only playing, they were also helping around the house. We started hearing a lot of about kids, you know, my kid just started making breakfast for everybody, or, you know, the, the, I, I had a friend whose daughter who was 20 had to drive to my house to get yeast because their entire town in New Jersey somewhere was out of yeast because so many people were baking. And that includes a ton of kids making a ton of cookies and of course the famous sourdough bread. Nobody gives me sourdough bread, I love it. Um, so we wanted to capture this because there's, there's two narratives going on at the moment, really three. Um, first is, of course, that some kids are in dire straits if they don't have food, much less, you know, sourdough bread, if their parents have lost their jobs, if they're in a dangerous house. That's awful, ipso facto. Um, then we were hearing a lot about, um, there's a lot of stories about, can your kid cope? You know, how are they dealing with the uh, true sorrow of not seeing their friends? Are they falling apart? And are we going to need an army of trauma counselors um, when the kids return to school or even now? Is, and it was sort of only seen through the lens of what bad mental health outcomes there could be for kids' um, disruption in their routine. But what we were seeing, and in part because we were looking for it, is the upside of ditching the routine. No more after school chess, no more lacrosse practice, no more before school homework help, no less homework, less school. And this swath of free time was uh, so boring, <laughs> you know? I mean, kids were used to you know, having an activity. Even my kids would ask me on Saturdays, what are we doing today? It's like, oh, I felt embarrassed. I felt like they should be doing what you were saying, you know, get out on your bike and go ride. And they weren't because an era that I was bringing up my kids was already different. So faced with this swath of free time, they were so bored and boredom is so painful that they were like, ah, maybe I will vacuum or, you know, my mom and dad are both working. It would be cool if I could make, you know, supper or um, maybe I'll just go do something outside. And so we were seeing all this spontaneous independence and and we believed that part of it was not just the boredom, but before, um, before this strange break from everybody's extremely, almost unforgiving routine of, you know, get up at 7.05 and out the door at 7.27, otherwise you're the last in the drop-off line or your kid is late for the bus and you're late for school and then they can't go to their after-school thing because they're in detention. There was just like so little space to breathe and then suddenly all that's gone. And so if your kid spills, when they're making breakfast, it doesn't matter because there's time to clean it up. So you could let your kid start doing things that they might not do as efficiently as you, but that's okay because you don't have to be efficient. And mm -hmm. we wanted to capture that. So, so that's what the independence challenge was. We asked people to send us essays, um, photos, and videos of their kids doing something new on their own. So that's you what you saw in the video. And you can I'm find like, that, what is I'm, it, letgrow.org? Is that where you letgrow can Letgrow.org. Click on independence, get, go to letgrow, L-E-T-G-R-O-W.org. And then, um, you know, look in the search bar for the independence challenge. And you'll just see picture after picture of, That's you know, the, mowing the lawn and one kid cutting her grandfather's hair, which is 
yeah, bad, yeah. but <laughs> but good. <laughs> Peter, um, sorry, were you about to say something? Yeah, I wanted uh, to comment yeah. on the on on the importance of independence. You know that from an evolutionary perspective, the purpose of childhood is to become increasingly independent. The child from almost from birth on is striving for more independence. You know, the natural selection has created that. That children, of course, are dependent when they're babies, but they become increasingly independent towards adulthood. And that's why, that's why children naturally want to do things on their own. They want to do their own things. They don't want to always be told what to do. And, and we struggle in our culture, we struggle with kids to make them do what we want them to do rather than let them do what they want to do. But they, they know in their bones, in their genes, they know that they've got to learn to take charge of their own lives. And that's why they want to do that. So now here, there's little space to do it. And they're moving into that space and doing it. I, I want to wait. I, I just wanted to say something, Peter, which is that it's not that um, we're always telling them what to do. It's also we're always doing things for them. Um, exactly. Once again, because it's faster, or we can do it better, or we don't want them to fail, or we don't want them to be frustrated. And so it's like, here, honey, let me help. But always help. And one of our many phrases is always helping kids is hurting them because they don't start doing it. And at first, you're not going to be good at anything. So they don't get used to being frustrated and then getting a little better and then doing it. And, and it is, it's, it's terrible to be constantly dependent and treated like a baby when you're primed by evolution to start you know, taking charge of things and helping out. We didn't even let them help out very much until now when mm -hmm. there was- Well, you know, there, there's actually, I, I wrote a blog post on this based on the research that's been done. There, there have been studies showing that toddlers, given the opportunity, if they see their parents cleaning the house or washing dishes, want to help. Every one of them essentially <laughs> wants to help. They want to do it. <laughs> and in right. our culture, Parents typically don't let them do it because they think they won't do it well, it'll slow them down, and it will slow them down, and they won't do it well. But it turns <laughs> out that indigenous cultures, they're wise to this, <laughs> even in the sort of semi-indigenous cultures. So there's studies in Guatemala, studies in Mexico of people who are at least sort of closely related to their indigenous background. They let the toddlers help out, even though it's not all that much help. And you know what they discover is that then by the time they're a little older, they're real help. <laughs> and they and they do these things. So it's kind of, and people might be surprised that one of the things that the kids are craving to do is actually cooking, <laughs> you know, and housework, and they're doing this stuff. Um, isn't that surprising? You know, we think yeah. that you'd have to pay them to do it or you'd have to nag them to do it. And now just because they've got free time, they want to do it. <laughs> well, let's, um, actually, I just want to remind everyone too, uh, the Q&A button is down at the bottom. I'll start taking questions and comments. Let us know what you're seeing either in your family, in your neighborhood, your communities, um, and uh, both, you know, good stories and maybe not such good stories. Just let's, let, right. us, let us have right. that. Um, let me, I'm going to stay with you, Peter, for a second. We are the Family Online Safety Institute. Um, there's a, you know, there's been a vexed uh, debate over the last couple of years about screen time. Um, what, what do you feel about that debate and, and how is that Im being impacted by, by the pandemic? And for that matter, how kids play online? Yeah, well, I think that um, I've I've written quite a bit about this. I've written several blog posts on it, it, it and I got interested in this because so many parents um, ask me about it. I give a lot of talks on play, and usually the first question when I didn't talk about screenplay, video play, uh, would be, well, what about video games? And the assumption would be that I would be against video games, and I'd be telling them to limit their limit the kids' screen time and so on. The truth of the matter is I didn't know how to answer the question. So I, um, I did some research on it. I mean, that's what I do. I, <laughs> I review other people's research. I'm a textbook author, among other things, a psychology textbook author. So I, so I made a list. I, I started off by Googling um, harmful effects. I started with video games. So let me talk about that. Harmful effects of video games. And I came up with this list and I sort of concluded um, somewhat tongue in cheek that every malady of adolescence short of acne <laughs> is apparently caused by video games. Obesity, social isolation, anger, uh, violence, um, 
uh, they become addicted to it and so on and so forth. And so then I asked the question, all right, so I'm seeing all this stuff, all these claims, are they citing any evidence for this? <laughs> and, and I pursued the evidence and I found precious little evidence for any of these claims. And once I got into the actual research literature, what I found was much more evidence for positive effects of video games than negative effects. And so I began to, began to realize that in this day and age, this was before the pandemic, where video play is sort of the only way you can play away from adults. <laughs> uh, it's a heck of a lot better to be playing video games than not to be playing. And so those kids who are playing video games, they're getting experience to play. This is real play. They're interacting with other people. They're online games. These are creative. They're very creative games. They are challenging, mentally challenging. There's a lot of research on the mental growth that occurs from video games. So I couldn't find evidence for the negative effects that people are talking about. I do realize that some kids have what I would call a time management problem. Some people call it addiction, where they're playing this game more than would be good for the family, good for them maybe. and. Um, and uh, and it it sort of usurps you know they're doing it instead of eating dinner and so on and i'm sympathetic with parents who are concerned about that and but i would rather call it a time management problem you know it puts it in the realm of normality rather than calling it you know, like this is a similar to a drug addiction where you're physically addicted to the thing so that's mm -hmm. that's on video games social media there was a great book written a few years ago um, by a woman named dana boyd uh, uh, in which she surveyed uh, teenagers across the country about why they are on social media so much, what they're doing on social media. And what she concluded is that they're on social media so much because that's the only way they can get together with their peers. <laughs> you know, they can't get together in physical space. They're not allowed to. They're not, these are teenagers. They're not, you know, they're either their parents don't allow them to go out or even, even if they do go out, I, I know when my son was a kid, um, teenager was sort of the era when you would find gangs of teenagers around shopping malls, you know, they'd be roaming the shopping malls and <laughs> how they'd get together. You don't see that anymore. And you know, what I've learned is that if the parents allow them out, the security guards don't allow them. So we have basically banned teenagers from public spaces. We've banned them from getting together in situations where their parents aren't there and other adults aren't there and they need to get together with without their parents and without adults especially teenagers do younger kids do too i would argue and so this is how they do it <laughs> you know so that's uh that's the so the, those are two aspects of screen time the other thing you know when people talk about screen time it means so many things i mean the screen time is what used to be a the screen is what used to be a book it's what used to be a movie it what you it's what used to be a board game it's all of these things and so when when we say that kids are on screens for a little x number of hours uh, a day or whatever you know, that doesn't mean they're doing the same thing that whole time. <laughs> I just have to tell you, can I tell you about this dad I was talking to yesterday, his son is 13, and obviously there's a lot of free time now, and the kid is sneaking his phone into the bathroom, or when he does something outside, there's always his headphones in, and what is he doing? He is researching, particularly infinity cars, I don't know why, he's researching cars because he's absolutely fascinated by them. And he started writing a blog post, you know, sort of critiquing different cars and what's good about them. And, and um, he's absorbing something that just fascinates him and he can't get enough. And I, you know, and the dad was a little concerned, even though the dad understands that learning doesn't always look like you're studying a book. Um, but when I said like, well, what if he, had, he got like car and driver, muscle car magazine, you know, car of the month magazine. And he was like waiting for <laughs> all those and flipping through all those pages and underlining articles and, you know, cutting out pictures and putting them on the wall. Well, that's what he's doing, except it's called a blog now. And so to, to say screen time is the opposite of learning when there's so many things that you can be learning and it is the way, it's an efficient way of learning. I mean, you can read about what a car looks like if you can see the video of how it's different from another car when it takes off zero to 60, that's, that's real learning. So 
um, like Peter said, the idea of screen time being one thing and that one thing being detrimental to your child's brain seems as ridiculous as saying books are bad because they're not scrolls and scrolls well, me... are bad because they're not cuneiform. <laughs> right, right. So, so hold on a second. We're now getting a flood of comments and questions, which is great. Um, and two opposing comments on this right away. Sylvie Crawford says, I agree, Peter, it is self-identified as a time management issue for the children in my life. And when they have realized this, they've enlisted my help to remind them of what time it is, et cetera, so they can learn to set their own limits on how much they play video games. On the other side of it, Anonymous is saying, I'm going to strongly disagree with the video games justification of it being just play. This is an addiction next to pornography. I've seen students fail, fall out of school because of them, marriage is ruined, and it starts with child playing them. It is not time management, exclamation mark. There is an endorphin that kicks in and you can't get them off of the game. Um, so you have a strongly agree and a strongly oppose. Um, any thoughts on the strongly opposed? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I've, I've written two blog posts on video game addiction and what's the evidence for the addiction and, and so on. I, so I would point people to that if you just Google Peter Gray, Psychology Today, uh, video game addiction, um, where I review the evidence. There's actually the World Health Organization has developed a uh, questionnaire for assessing um, what they call video game disorder, which is basically video game addiction. Basically what they did is they took the um, assessment for gambling uh, addiction and they just substituted gaming for gambling. And so this has been done, this has been administered to, to people, large numbers of people who play lots of video games. The number who come out addicted by that measure, and, and I have to say it's a very questionable measure. There's people on both sides of the question of whether this is a meaningful measure that comes out um, that based on the study, it's anywhere from a high of 5% to a low of uh, something like point. 0.5% of, uh, of, of heavy video game players are addicted. So by that measure. So it's by no means the case that you can think that just because somebody plays a lot of video games that they are addicted to it. I also, um, I also happen to know a psychotherapist who specializes in helping people who have this kind of a problem. And he's, he, he's where I learned to call it time management. He had said the first thing he does is he says, this is not an addiction, it's a time management problem. You simply have to learn how to manage your time better and let's talk about how to do that. And it gets it out of the realm of pathology. So we, we have so pathologized, some, at least some as elements of our society has so pathologized anything having to do with video games that it leaves the realm of sort of common sense. And if we get over these pathological ways of describing it, then we can talk more common sense. The whole issue of endorphins, the issue, you know, there was a, there was a headline in the New York Post, a huge headline in the New York Post that said, digital heroin. This is the kind of scare that parents digital are what? reading. Digital, digital heroin. That was the oh, title heroin. of the article. Right. Digital heroin. And so what's the evidence that it's digital heroin? So the primary evidence that scares parents is the claim that, um, that the same areas of the brain light up when you're playing a video game as light up <laughs> when you are uh, taking heroin or taking cocaine or any of these other kinds of addictive drugs. Well, guess what? These are the pleasure areas of the brain. <laughs> These are the areas of the brain that light up when you're doing anything that's fun, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is the evidence that video games are fun. <laughs> Everything you do, the only way you could prevent those parts of the brains from becoming active is by ensuring that you never do anything that's fun. And, um, and then there'd probably be some people whose brain area would light up just because they're so successful and avoid anything that's fun that they find, <laughs> oh, this is fun. I'm avoiding everything that's fun. Oh, there goes that brain area. Mm, so like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> right. What are we going to do? You know, so, so, the, uh, the, so the kinds of scare tests, that we, I would recommend there's a big difference between the actual research literature that's done and the, and the way that gets interpreted <laughs> by the popular press and then exaggerated you know, on blogs and as people talk about it. 
Now, I, at the same time that I say this, I know that there are families where the child is playing video games at the extent of other things. Um, I think the thing to do is to, is to, in most of the cases, there actually is research that where, where do, is it most problematic? And what the research tends to show where there's somebody, some kid who's depressed and playing video games. And the question is, are they depressed because they're playing video games or are they playing video games because they're depressed? And most of the research indicates they're playing video games to the exclusion of other things because they're depressed. Video games do something they can do. They're too depressed to do other things that would be better for them that they really need to do. So the solution, according to this research, is not necessary to take the video game away, but it's to learn what else, to try to help this person find what else is missing in their life. What's happening? Are you being, are you being bullied in school? Are you being, you know, what, are you not having fun? lost track of anything else. So that's the kind of therapy uh, or help that, that, that those people need. And by the way, this is affecting adults just as much as kids. Uh, they, there are a lot of adults who fall, in, fall into this category. And so, um, so I think it's, uh, I, th I think we need to bring the realm of common sense into this. But by, by the way, just for the fun of it, when I, when I read that, took, looked at that questionnaire for assessing uh, video game addiction, I thought about myself when I was uh, 11 years old and I was into fishing. And I, I took the questionnaire thinking of my 11 year old self and I substituted for gaming, I substituted fishing. And it turned out when I was 11 years old, I had a fishing addiction. <laughs> you know, I, here, some of the questions are thinks about it when not doing it. Oh, of course I did. <laughs> Needs higher and higher levels of it to gain the same satisfaction. Oh yeah, I needed to go for bigger and bigger fish. I need to go for <laughs> more and more difficult fish to catch to make it fun. Sometimes lies about it. Oh, there, uh, I was a pretty good kid, but once in a while I skipped school to go fishing and I, I probably lied about it. <laughs> you know, these, uh, somehow nobody labeled me as having an addiction a fish at that addict, time. Yeah, yeah a yeah. fishing addiction. But, Very uh, good. <laughs> um, Lenore, I do thank you for that, Peter. Uh, Lenore, I wanted to bring you in because I understand that you guys at Let Grow have conducted a survey. I'm not sure if that's out yet or not. But yeah, the survey results aren't out, but I can tell you off the record that they do seem to be very positive. Um, what we were studying is what new things kids are doing, um, feeling, and what parents are noticing different about their kids um, during the, you know, the school closure, we call it. And the broad outlines are that kids are doing exactly what you saw in our Independence Challenge video. They are, you know, they're doing more things on their own. They're helping out around the house in um, what strike me as extraordinary levels because I didn't have my kids helping out enough around the house apparently because uh, like, you know, three quarters of the rest of the world is doing that at least now. And um, they seem pretty calm. <sighs> maybe more calm than during the regular school year when once again, we're talking about that very structured and um, unforgiving schedule that a lot of kids had. And it's not mm. to say that parents are having an easier time. I think, you know, I hear about parents at their wits end because they are trying to watch their kids and do their work and get food on the table. I mean, it's just a, a whole lot of things um, that they have to be multitasking. You can't really multitask your job and cooking and watching the kids. Um, the one good thing about that is that watching the kids goes a little bit by the wayside. And so, yes, kids are having more screen time, but yes, they are getting on their bikes and they're, and when Peter, when you were talking about like, at first you have kids help out and they're not very good at helping and then they get better. I'd say that it sounds to me like three quarters of the country's, you know, chefs in training are making cookies or pancakes um, or scrambled <laughs> eggs. I mean, and then I started thinking maybe it's because their parents don't know how to cook. And so there's just not a whole lot of, um, you know, from one generation to another teaching how to make, uh, you know, Coco Vin is probably not happening. But anyway, so they're not that helpful unless you want a, a steady diet of pancakes and cookies, but they are learning how to be in the kitchen, how to measure and how to deal with the stove. And um, eventually they'll be able to do more. So yeah. um, our, our findings were uh, very positive and I wasn't surprised. 
Um, I was delighted to find my bias confirmed. <laughs> Aren't we all? That's like the Onion uh, headline the other day that says, new study confirms everything you know, uh, area man thought was true. And of course, that's the study that I would <laughs> flog. Um, but uh, it, might, it might surprise um, the hand ringers that uh, there's just this amazing silver lining in terms of kids coming into their own. And I'll, I'll just tell a quick story, uh, one of like a million that I wrote down here. Um, but this is about a mom who has a seven-year-old daughter and the mom used to be a school counselor, now she's a stay-at-home mom. And every morning, first grade, the mom would come in and it's like, come on, it's time to get up, we gotta get up. And then she'd come back later and the kid was still in bed. Come on, we gotta get going. Come on, the bus is gonna come, let's go, let's go. And it was always the mother, you know, talk about in extrinsic motivation, the mother saying, come on, get up, we gotta get out of here. And then the kid would go downstairs and the mom would put her cereal in there and pour the milk and come on, you gotta eat, eat, eat. tie the shoes so they can get out of the door fast. And then kerflui, everything went um, to hell in a handbasket. And now the mom sleeps in in the morning and not only does the girl wake up and get her own breakfast, the cereal and the milk, but sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes she will also, you know, prepare her mom's simple breakfast, which is a banana and um, some toast. And then she butters the toast for her mom. I don't know if the toast then gets cold or she knocks on the door or what, but she butters the toast. And that struck me as um, just sort of emblematic of what we're seeing, which is that obviously this seven-year-old was capable all along of making her own breakfast and and helping her mother, you know, thinking what does my mother need and how can I be um, a, a big kid who actually makes my mom's life easier instead of just waiting for my mom to pour everything and do everything and drag me out of bed. But we would never have seen that. Her mother would have never seen the toast butterer inside this, you know, foot dragging recalcitrant seven year old un until the pandemic hit because kids are these seeds and seeds need water to grow. And mm. at Let Grow, we think that independence or free time, freedom, is what allows them to grow. And there was none of that until now. And so I feel like there's these toast butterers popping up like dandelions across the country, doing all the things that they were capable of, that Peter would have said evolutionarily they were programmed to do, that we had stunted and kept underfoot because we just didn't have the time. And also we were told that a good parent does everything for the kids. So we were just doing everything for them and leaving them un, ungerminated, you know, un, yeah. and now they're, they're blossoming. Yeah, um, Sylvie Crawford writes in, not a question, but a comment. My kids grow up self-directed and they absolutely love cooking, cleaning windows. It's play to them. I think it's an interesting, very interesting twist. Peter, I wanna to come to you. Uh, Anonymous has said, you've both noted what you consider to be progress in independence for kids during the pandemic. What can we do going forward to preserve those gains and institutionalize them so that the progress doesn't evaporate once we're back to normal, in quotes. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm glad to. Uh, right. Thank you. I, you can uh, take it, Peter, but then I'm going to have to jump in. We, right, uh, after you. If we were to plant a question, that would have been it. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous looks a lot like it's coming from Lenore's server. <laughs> right. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, this, so great question. So one thing, so what I want to remind people, it's not just school that's closed. It's all these act after school activities that we've been driving kids around to. It's all those kinds of things that we've been keeping the kids have, have kept kids busy so they haven't had time to think and do their own thing. I think there's going to be a lot of families that are going to recognize, you know, we don't need all these after school activities. My kid's okay just being home and doing these kinds of things that my kid is doing. And won't it be great also when they can go outside and the, and the COVID-19 is no longer a threat. And now in addition to all the things they're doing now, they can play with their friends in the neighborhood. Wouldn't that be a great conclusion? I also, I think it's going to affect the way parents think. I think it's going to affect the way kids think. Kids are not going to want to go back to all all these adult directed activities after experiencing this period of free play, they're going to want to preserve some of it. You know, so that, so I think that's part of it. I also think that I, maybe this is hopeful thinking. Uh, it's more than wishful thinking. <laughs> it's hopeful thinking that um, schools are going to learn a lesson that um, they don't need to give the kids all this homework. <laughs> uh, one of the things that one of the things I'm hearing from families, I'm hearing this from quite a few parents, um, 
you know, my kid is doing all the homework that the school is sending them. Presumably they're sending them the whole curriculum, but my kid can finish this by noon, <laughs> you know, between 10 and noon in the morning. Uh, these are for kids who get up at 10, for kids who get up at where most kids do, it's from noon to two, and they finish the homework. And then, and then the rest of the day is free. Uh, so do we actually need all this time in school? Do we need it? Why, why spend such a long school day? Maybe more schooling could be, maybe more of what they do could be online. You know, that's, uh, of course, this is more screen time, but you know, this is more of it could be online. More of it, there are more efficient ways. I think just as careers, just as adults are learning, that. Why do I need to commute into that office every single day when I can be just about as productive, maybe more productive from home? I think the schools may be learning some of that lesson too. Now, uh, admittedly, one of the purposes of school is to serve as sort of babysitting. So for the kids are off someplace. But I think that one of the things we might be learning is, well, kids beyond a certain age maybe don't need that so much. And maybe there's other ways of solving that kind of a problem. And so school doesn't have to occupy so much of children's lives. They can have more time to be uh, self-directed and pursue their own hobbies and play with kids and just be kids. Right. Yeah. Although some of that could be more at school too. I mean, because you have a critical mass of kids to play with each other and you have a, maybe a lab there or a, an art room or a music room. Um, there's, there's a couple of things that Let Grow does that are school initiatives that are free that schools might consider um, adopting because they will allow kids to keep being independent and playing. And one is called the Let Grow Project. And it's online at our Let Grow site. And it is this, it's teachers give kids the homework assignment of you have to go home and do something on your own without your parents. And once COVID lifts, it can be, you know, run an errand or back to making something for your parents or um, babysit, uh, learn to ride your bike, anything that is outside of, um, you know, being helped and preferably outside of the home. And that definitely would preserve this whole idea of kids doing more and more on their own and sort of institutionalize independence because then kids come and they all share what they just did. And some schools, they'll have the kids read stuff over the loudspeaker, what they just did on their own. Some schools put up a, a, you know, a paper tree on the wall and then kids fill out leaves like I babysat my brother, I taught my sister how to ride a bike, I made dinner for the family, I learned to make tortillas. So the Lecro project is a very simple and once again, free way to make sure that independence and kids just keeps growing. And the other idea is that as long as it's good to have kids gathering together and they're eager to be together again, um, if you have a let grow play club at your school, which was Peter's idea, a play club is basically a nice word for a bunch of kids just together with a lot of loose parts. So either before school or after school, you say, okay, kids, you can come and be on the, the blacktop or the playground or in the gym with a bunch of balls and junk and uh, hula hoops and what have you. And that way you, um, you, know, you have a critical mass of kids you have mixed age kids playing together and there's an adult there just like the nurse, right? In case something goes wrong, but they're not organizing the games. They're not solving the problems. They are just um, there, you know, in case of, a, of an emergency. So you can definitely keep the play going and the independence going if you have a little bit of support from the school and, and the school reminding parents that, you know, COVID wasn't a lost time. Your kids got a lot out of it and they can still keep growing that same independent way, um, even though now they're back in school. A very nice segue to what you just said. Michael Montgomery from Canada says, I've been going to the forest with my two girls almost every day, and they have been so very creative. They took their experiences back into school because we returned a few weeks ago. They returned to school. Wow. And, have give, and they have given presentations to their classmates on bird identification. <laughs> The schools are endorsing going to the forest now and promoting it as well. So that's a perfect example of bringing this, what we're learning in the pandemic. I think you called it pandemic playtime, Peter, isn't that right? <laughs> Is that an example of pandemic playtime? Uh, and then bringing that back into the institutionalized school environment. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I, 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 I think that many teachers have, uh, have long wanted this. <laughs> I think we've been, so what's happened in schools is so driven by uh, 
by testing and test scores and, and imp the imposed uh, tests. Uh, and I think that one of, you know, one of the things that has happened is that the, the, uh, the national uh, tests have been, ha aren't being given this year. And I think a lot of people are feeling some relief about that. <laughs> it frees things up in a lot of ways. And teachers in general have long been against those standardized tests. Um, and I, um, I, a teacher who, uh, who uh, frequents my, my blog and my uh, Facebook page did a little survey of teachers online. And she said, what's the one thing that you hope will change as a result of this, uh, when we go back to school, and far and away, the majority of them said that that we stop giving standardized tests. <laughs> uh -huh. That this is what's destroying education, in their view, because so much of the focus is on these standardized tests, which is all stuff that has very little to do with real life, and the teachers realize that the children are being harmed by the constant drill and pressure for these tests. And that's why they've cut back recess. That's why they have uh, given so much more homework. That's why they've taken away the creative things from school, like writing poems and stories just for the fun of it or decorating the classroom. All the things that used to be fun about school taken away for the sake of these tests. And I think that, I, I think that there's gonna be real pressure for uh, taking that test pressure off. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right, um, I, I wanna put a slightly contrary uh, comment here from Anonymous for many students, school meets Anonymous. needs that are not being met in their homes, whether it be social, emotional, physical, or curriculum. For the most part, students are not covering the same amount of the curriculum while at home during this distance learning. They're not getting the support that they get in school. For many students, the school day is the best part of their day. How would their needs be addressed without schools? And we have very little time, but I just wonder if either of you had a quick comment on that, on that question. Lenore? Um, in our unpublished study, I can tell you that the vast majority of kids are looking forward to going back to school. And the unmet need that they state is that they wanna be around their friends. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's great to have a gathering place for kids and uh, I'm not anti-school. I just think the idea of, maybe a little more free time, self-direction, play time, a um, little less homework. And uh, to me, those seem like things that everybody is recognizing are good for kids, not that uh, we blow up all the schools. Okay, You might disagree. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree exactly with what uh, Lenora is saying. And in addition, so we, we have increased the amount of homework. We've increased the amount of testing uh, in ways that have made school increasingly stressful. Um, there was a survey done by the American Psychological Association about four years ago called on Stress in America, and they found that teenagers in high school are the most stressed out people in America, and 83% of them attribute their stress to school. The other thing we know is that suicides among school-aged children are, the rate of suicide among school-aged children is double during the school year what it is off the school year. So there's no question but what school is, is pressured and stress-inducing and even pathologically so for many, many children. We've got to reduce the pressure that's coming from school. We don't hear enough about that pressure. Everybody wants to look at everything else to explain why children are so depressed and anxious and suicidal to, to a degree that we've never seen in, a, in, a, in America before. And everybody wants to blame video games. They want to blame anything else except school. When you ask kids, it's school. Okay, all right. Well, uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. In a 240 characters or less, uh, Lenore, um, what's your greatest hope coming out of this extraordinary time that we're in? Uh, what, what, what's, what's your greatest, um, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, what would come out of this uh, crazy pandemic that we're in? Um, I think a recognition, like I was talking with the, about the toast butterer before, that our kids have so much potential for joy, for finding their bliss, for finding something that interests them, for self, not just self-direction, but um, coming into their own. And that requires free time. And so to recognize not only the value of free time, but that what looks like wasted time is just time on the way to something else. You cannot expect every moment to be 
um, programmed and that to be the only way that kids learn. Um, my favorite story that I discovered when I was doing research on this was um, the, that Einstein, when he was a little kid, he, what did he do? He, he made houses out of cards. Um, which, which seems like the definition of a stupid waste of time. You know, you don't get to live in the house. <laughs> they all collapse. <laughs> you just make it again. And yet you think about, well, what is he doing? Maybe his mind is wandering. Maybe he's thinking about things. Meanwhile, he's learning a little bit of physics, patience, try, try again, tolerance for frustration. So if your kid looks like they're just wasting their time, you don't have to rush to fill it because time a time that is not structured and doesn't look like it's important to you, a kid reading the blogs about all the cars that he cares about, this is how kids discover what they love. And that gives them, you know, focus and, um, and drive and curiosity and creativity. So I hope that parents seeing this long swath of free time don't rush to fill it all immediately when COVID is over. Great. And Peter, final word, one sentence or two. Yeah, I would, my hope is that it leads the whole culture to a renewed uh, understanding of childhood, what childhood is all about, and the importance of childhood and letting children be children. We're right now letting children be children, not as fully as we, as we would like because they can't play with one another outdoors freely, but the importance of childhood and the fact that children come into the world designed to do things that are in the long run good for them. We have to trust their <laughs> instincts much more than we have. Great. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that summation, both of you. Um, just to answer one of the questions I've just seen, yes, this full video will be available. We're going to package it up into a email in a day or two's time. We'll also send out links to some of the resources that we mentioned, including Let Grow, uh, Peter's book. Um, Lenore, if there's other things you'd like folks to know, let us know. Um, we will be hosting another webinar shortly. Uh, we'll be sending it out as part of our series. Uh, thank you both so very, very much. That's very so stimulating. Fun. Way too many questions that I could get to, but thank you all for participating in this way. Thank you to my colleagues who've been working behind the scenes to make sure the trains run on time. Uh, get out there and play. It's a beautiful day, folks. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Bye. Bye, Stephen. Bye, Peter. Bye.